When I talk about the rule for the limit of a composition, one of the requirements was that for my inside function, the limit of the function as it went to its point was actually equal to the function's value itself. So we want to take a closer look at this idea, which is going to be called continuity. So let's just throw up a definition, and then I'll start pulling things apart. So let's say function f is continuous at x equals x0 if three things happen. First, we want our function defined at x0. So remember to take a limit. Your function did not need to be defined at the point that you're taking the limit at. So here, we're going to want that the function actually has a value there. Second, we're going to want the limit at our point x0 to exist, and we'll say that its value is equal to L. And then what we want is that limit to be equal to the actual value of the function. So what's the idea here? Three ways to think of this. Okay, well, if I have that the limit's equal to the actual value of the function, what we're saying is you take your best fitting point, pick the y value, that's going to be actually equal to what the function told you in the first place. So what it means is you're starting out with your best fitting point. Another way, if I want to predict the value of the function at our point, so this is going back to day one, where you walk into a room, you see a function on the board like this. There's a hole in it. Where would you put the point? Well, that point's already filled in by the function, and it's what you would expect. So the idea is that the prediction of the value of the function matches up with the actual value of the function. The third way to think of this is to think of the way we thought about limits. Okay, so the idea is going to be if I start out with points close to x0, we apply f. The points that come out are going to have to stay near f of x0. So the idea before would have been the points would have to stay close to the limit, but now we know the limit's equal to f of x0, so the points stay close to f of x0. And this is our old picture. The only thing that's changed now is we're not using L for the limit here. We're actually using the value of the function. If you put all this together, it's kind of saying the value that the function should be at your point x0 is what it actually winds up being. So let's take a look at what can go wrong with continuity. For our first case, okay, this guy we've seen before. Take x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. We factor. We get our x plus 1. But the penalty from the original function is that we're not allowed to divide by 0. So I can't have x equal to 1. So our graph looks like this with a hole above 1. So our function's not defined there. And we call this a removable discontinuity because you could fix it if you just filled it in that point. OK, second case. We've seen this one before. I'm going to take f of x equal to x when I'm less than 1 or 1 plus x when I'm bigger than 1. Okay, our graph looks like this, and we call this a non-removable discontinuity. It can't be fixed by just adjusting one point. You could fix this if you shifted part of the graph either up or down, but there's no clear way to know which one's going to be preferred. So the idea here is, if I come in from the right, come in from the left, they're not going to agree, so there's no limit. Okay, an even worse scenario would be where we're looking at f of x equal to 1 over x squared. So here, there's no way you could even shift the graph to try to make ends meet up. Here, we're going to have division by 0 at 0, and both of these are going to go up to plus infinity. So you have a vertical asymptote, no way to fix that. So that's a non-removable discontinuity. In our third case, we have the limit exists, the function's defined at the point, but we're going to fail the equality test. So what we could do is take the first example and say you ask someone to fix it, they bring it back to you and it says f of 1 equals 3. Okay, so they really didn't fix it because, well, okay, intuitively, we would love to have that point filled in here. So you're not going to have continuous here because the value of the function doesn't match up with the limit. And kind of the idea here is also, if I'm continuous at a point, I should be able to kind of draw through the point without picking my pen up. But to draw the function through this point, I have to kind of pick the pen up, fill it up up here, and then come back down and keep going. So again, this is going to be a removable discontinuity because I could fix it if I just erase that point and then filled it back in there. So changing one point makes it continuous at the point. For our next definition, 
We'll say f is continuous on the interval a, b if it's continuous at each point inside the interval a, b. All right, so the idea here is just I have my interval. I check every point on the interval, and I don't see any of the discontinuity showing up that we just talked about. So the idea is really going to be, can I draw f without picking up my pencil? So that's meaning we're not going to have to jump or tear the graph when we try to draw it. So here it's good, here it's bad. Here, if I want to draw this, I hit my jump discontinuity. So to keep drawing, I have to jump and then keep going. So not continuous at that point there. Okay, it's going to be useful later on to talk about continuity on a closed interval, meaning we want the endpoints of the interval. So we have to define a notion of one-sided limits and then one-sided continuity. So let's take a look. So what we're going to need is, for instance, what's going to happen here? Well, at one, I don't have a limit because I have a jump continuity. I can't get both sides to agree. But that's actually a good thing, because if you notice, we're talking about both sides not being able to agree at least says both sides have something to say. For instance, if I took the limit as I come in from 1 on the left, we're seeing that the value of the function really wants to be equal to 1. So if I throw away the top or everything to the right, the best fitting point is going to be right there. I take its y value, I get 1. Okay, So that's how I would say this. I want to say the limit as x goes to 1 from the left, we're going to put a little minus sign on there because all the negative numbers are on the left side, although we may not be using negative numbers. But we'll take the one-sided limit from the right. I'll forget about everything on the left of my limit, or my point, at 1. Then we're going to take the best fitting point here, so that's going to be this point there where it's already defined. So the limit as x goes to 1 from the right is going to be equal to 2. We take best fitting point, take its y value, there it's going to be 2. Okay, so that's how we do one-sided limits. Now, some things to note. One-sided limits tend to put students off, but really they shouldn't because for one, it's less to check. When you're trying to find a one-sided limit, you don't have to check both sides. You only have to check one. So, in that way, they're a little bit nicer. Another thing, if you're asked to find a one-sided limit, well, if you can find the limit from both sides, you get the one-sided limits for free. So when you're asked to compute a one-sided limit, see if you can do it without the plus or minus in there. If you can, you've already got your answer. So as an example, let's try the limit for x going to 2 from the right of x squared plus 4x. Now, this is a polynomial, so we know we can get the limit if I throw away the plus sign. I do that. I get x squared plus 4x. We're going to put a 2 into the, each part of that. It's going to give me 4 plus 8, which is going to give me 12. So that's going to be the answer also for the right-sided limit. It's also the answer for the left-sided limit also. So when you're asked to evaluate these one-sided things, just remember, if you can do it with the plus or minus gone, you've already got your answer. Now, with one-sided limits in place, we could talk about continuous from the left or right of a function. That's just going to be, okay, you take your function f, you take the limit, say as we go from the left, okay, is that going to be equal to the actual value of the function? If it is, we call that continuous from the left at the point x equal to x0. We have a similar definition if you want to go from the right. In this case, you just, you're just asking, does the limit as we come in from the right equal the actual value? So a little bit more for continuity, just a little bit technical. We'll want it for later on. And also note, we really should have this business with one-sided stuff, because think of it this way. If I want to predict the future, okay, I know all my data that's coming up in the past. For instance, if we're talking about the stock market, I don't know the future. So in this case, the limits that we'd be interested in are always going to be things that lead up till the point in time where you know all your data. You don't know the future, so you're always looking at a one-sided graph. 